morning. Welcome to Shady Grove Presbyterian Church for our service of worship this morning. Um, Will Christians is out of town or has been on vacation, still on vacation, and will be back next week. Uh, I'm Reverend Sarah Strong here to fill in and a uh, parish associate. This morning we are uh, just thrilled to have Dr. Courtney Pace with us and she will be uh, bringing the message of the day um, later in the service. Uh, you may notice all the announcements on the back of your bulletin and I'm not going to read those to you because I know that you can read but if anyone has anything else they want to announce please uh, feel free to if you'd like to. Yes? Speak? <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Any others? Also, uh, welcome to Paul Cummings presenting our music. We are glad to have you here. And I uh, also want to welcome any visitors who are here today. We are glad you're here to worship with us. If you have any questions concerning Shady Grove, you can speak to me after the service. And so now, let us breathe in God's grace and prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. Oh Lord, you are the center of my life. I will always praise you, I will always serve you, I will always keep you in my sight. Keep me safe, O oh God, I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my God, my happiness lies in you. in you alone. Oh Lord, you are the center of my life. I will always praise you. I will always serve you. I will always keep you in my sight. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. directs my heart. I keep the Lord ever in my sight. Since he is at my right hand, I shall stand firm. O Lord, you are the center of my life. I will always praise you. I will always serve I will always keep you in my sight. I will show you the path of life, the fullness, fullness of joy in your presence. At your right hand, at your right hand, happiness forever.
And now, if you would please stand and let us join together in this morning's call to worship. Creating God, we gather in your name to worship you. We give thanks that there is a small spark of God within us. Kindle that small spark into a flame of love and service. Sustaining God, we gather in your name to worship you. We celebrate the loving presence of God in our life. May God's loving presence be a strong influence in our life. Nurturing God, we gather in your name to worship you. As we grow in faith, may our worship, witness, and service bless God's holy name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, in spite of our sin, God, who is merciful, God, who is love, offers us God's saving grace. Let us now together confess our sins before God and one another using the prayer of confession. God, you know everything about us, every word that is spoken, every thought that passes through our minds, every deed done, you know them all. So take a good look at us now. Look deep into our hearts and souls. Touch that which needs to change in our lives and in our world. Show us how to live as you desire. Amen. Friends, the psalmist assures us that the Lord our God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Indeed, our help is in the name of the Lord who forgives all our transgressions. And so, in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you that your sins and mine are forgiven, and thanks be to God. And now, may the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, and let us all be thankful and offer a sign of God's peace to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you.
How are you? Glad to see you again this morning. Some of you were here last week. Were you here last week? You were here last week. Okay. Um, and we talked about, we were trying to imagine how much, I love this, how much God loves us. Do you remember that? Do you remember little nut brown hair and big nut brown hair? Well, <clears throat> this week we're going to think about what we do with that love. Now, some people say, and we just talked about it together, that God's love makes a spark in our, inside of us. And we can make that spark grow when we love each other. I know a good song about this. You might know this song too. I know some people out there know about it. Um, would you like to learn this song? Say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. We're going to do kind of like we did the prayer last week where I sing a line, then you, sing, you echo it back. You sing it back, okay? <clears throat> I don't know if I can sing this morning. And I have to have my card because I, I want to do all the verses together. I get them all mixed up. It, you know what that's like? Okay. Okay. It goes, It only takes a spark to get a fire going. You see? It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And then all those around can warm up in its glowing. Ready, go. And then all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love, once you've experienced it, ready? That's how it is with God's love, once you've experienced it, you spread God's love to everyone, you want to pass it on, ready? You spread God's love to everyone. You want to pass it on. Isn't that a good song? I really like that song. I hope we'll do that some more. All right. Let's pray together. I'm not going to ask you to echo me this time. Dear God, we thank you for that part of us that is like you our own God spark. Show us how to make it grow and to pass it on to others. Amen. Thanks for coming down. Friends, I have missed you so much. I look around this room and I see places where our beloveds used to sit, now empty. And I see new friends to fall in love with. And since we've been friends for almost seven years, I feel like I need to come into this pulpit just as I am and tell you the whole truth today. The truth is my heart is broken. I am afraid. I am disgusted. I feel betrayed, but I'm not surprised. I am angry, and my feelings are bigger than my body. 
I want to rage, but I'm exhausted, and I don't know if it'll do any good. But here's something I can do. I can tell the truth. So today, as we look at Psalm 139, which I picked a month ago, not knowing we would be discussing it this day, a text so often used to suppress choice, a text so often used to induce guilt and heap shame and blame it on God, I seek a fresh word. I seek a revelation from God who we believe is active among us who we believe is working toward liberation and justice, even still. I suspect I'm not the only preacher preaching this text today, but I guarantee you I'm the only preacher who's going to preach it like this. So let us turn to the Word of God in Psalm chapter 139, beginning in verse 1. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Moving to verse 13, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Pray with me. God, as we read your word this day, we pray that you would be here with us. Help us to hear what you are saying. May we sense your Spirit's leadership for us this day and every day. Amen. The psalmist here is reflecting both on God as powerful and on God as a nurturer. God is celebrated here as all-knowing, as proactively seeking relationship with us. God who authentically and fully knows us and who keeps us safe. God who hems us in behind and before and lays their hand on us. That sounds like me trying to walk with my daughter behind and before and laying my hand on her. God who transcends time and space. And God is celebrated here as intimate nurturer. God who creates through imagination. God, the tender mother. I see a God of love. A God who cherishes their relationship with humanity. I see a God who respects humanity. And given this moment, I feel that same God calling me to proclaim candidly and just say some stuff. So here we go. Reproductive health care is as old as human history. 
As long as humans have lived, they have loved and they have reproduced and they have terminated pregnancies. You may recall reading about the bitter herbs in the Old Testament. You can look it up in Numbers 5, 21 through 28, if you're unsure. You may recall rumors of special teas you could drink. They're one and the same. And they are abortisants as old as time. Right there in our biblical text. Administered by priests. As medicine has advanced, so has our understanding of what can prevent or terminate pregnancy. When first invented, contraception was illegal, and after much suffering then was legal only for married women. Do you see the connection? Contraception was invented for all who needed it, but only available to married women. Those who prescribed it or took it could be jailed. But even then, there was no way to legally end a pregnancy. So women did what women have always done. They made their own way out. Thousands of women were seriously injured or died because of dangerous attempts to terminate pregnancies on their own. Some tried to kill themselves, and some succeeded. Many of you remember life before Roe. You remember girls who would disappear for a year or so and then come back like nothing had happened. You remember the homes for girls who got in trouble and the wire hangers and the home kits and how much bleeding there would be. Roe versus Wade gave women a future. It decreased the number of women dying by suicide. It increased the number of women finishing school. And it established opportunity for women to advance professionally and financially. Roe versus Wade gave women a future. I also understand that for some of you, the thought of an abortion is unconscionable. You could not imagine voluntarily terminating a pregnancy. Perhaps you struggled with infertility and wanted more than anything to have children. And you do not understand why someone who could conceive would not want to carry that child or let someone adopt that child. Or perhaps you believe theologically that abortion is immoral. Maybe you believe that life begins at conception or heartbeat, and that pregnancy is a covenant relationship for which we are chosen. This is a sensitive topic, and I want to show care for all of the delicate and legitimate feelings that we have. Let's hold on to our feelings, but let's bring information to the table in search of greater understanding for what's going on in this moment. An abortion is an elective termination of pregnancy. Most women in America receiving abortions already have children and recognize they cannot responsibly parent additional children. But some women terminate pregnancies because they're not at a place in life where they can be the kind of mother that they want to be. Because <coughs> they're still in school, or they're building their career, or they're in an abusive relationship, or they're not in good health. Some women learn that their children will have severe disabilities that they are not equipped to handle. And some pregnants are a threat to the mother's health. Some are not viable, even if carried to full term. And because of the way we count menstrual cycles, by the earliest possible time a woman could know she is pregnant, she is already considered four weeks pregnant. And I say that because in a state with a six-week ban, it's really a two-week ban. Have you ever been able to get off work and get two appointments with a specialist in high demand within two weeks. Six weeks is a near total ban, and we need to name that. 
Abortions do typically happen in the earliest stages of pregnancy. Most states that allow it, allow it through the first trimester or 12 weeks. A few states allow it through 20 weeks. And I'm not asking you to suddenly be comfortable with abortion if you're not. I'm not asking you to suddenly be okay with it if you're not. But I am asking you to think beyond your perspective to why other people might choose it for themselves. And I must put my Baptist hat on and remind us all of the separation of church and state. America does not have an official religion. It is built into the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights that our country does not endorse any particular religion, nor can any religion seek to use the government for itself. This means we all have freedom to believe what we believe. And the government will protect our right to believe that. But the government will protect everybody else's right to believe what they believe too. So let's think about that with some less emotionally expensive ideas first. Some of you curse like sailors. Can we just name that? And some of you would never, never speak such words. Cursing is legal. Though there are laws about what we can say in public and around children, you can choose to curse or not. And as long as you follow the law, you are protected in your choice. Some of us are open to more artistic adult content in movies and on the internet. And some of us believe this is exploitative and vile. There are laws to protect how these kinds of content are made and who can access them and how. And we can all choose what media we consume or don't. The law regulates for safety, and we have freedom to choose based on our convictions. There are a lot of things I do not like that are legal. And I can choose not to do them. I can choose not to financially support them. But I cannot interfere with other people's rights to make their own choices within the law. Similarly, abortion is regulated by the government to ensure that it is safe because when it is legal, it saves lives. If you think it's wrong, you have a right to think that it's wrong. And you don't ever have to have one, and rest assured your tax dollars will never support one. But you cannot prevent other people from accessing abortion care because you think it's wrong. Different faiths view the start of life differently. Did you know that in Judaism and Islam, life begins at birth and not during pregnancy at all? Christianity has a spectrum of beliefs ranging from conception to heartbeat to viability to birth, not to mention Buddhism or Hinduism or others. And there are people who don't practice religion at all, who have various beliefs about abortion, and all of those beliefs are protected by the First Amendment, which separates church and state. And so you can believe what you believe. And, and nobody is going to try to argue with you that you have to change your mind. But the government is going to protect everybody's right to believe what they believe too. And what the government should be doing is making sure things are legal and safe. Think about when someone you love has a serious illness for which there is a treatment. And they elect palliative care. Sometimes we understand why someone does not want to go through surgery or chemo or radiation because we know how treacherous that road would be. But sometimes this is devastating to families because we want our loved ones to fight for their lives so they can be with us longer. Ultimately, we let the patient decide their care because it's their decision. It is not up to us whether we agree with their decision or not. Oh, that we could think of reproductive care the same way. 
Whether you can understand why someone would elect an abortion or whether you could never understand, oh, that we could step back and realize it's just not up to us what someone else decides for their medical care. We have a right to feel how we feel, but they have the exclusive right to make the decision. And let me unpack farther why this SCOTUS decision is so devastating. Thousands of women will die. Thousands of LGBTQ people will not have access to health care. And thousands of LGBTQ teenagers will die by suicide. This will guarantee a permanent underclass of black and brown women and will codify white supremacy for generations. That is what will happen. This was a death sentence. No matter what that headline says, this is not about life. If it were about life, we would be talking about wide open doors at clinics and hospitals and increasing access to birth control, and not forewarning that it will be next on the chopping block. We would be celebrating love and marriage and not threatening to delegitimize the ones we find objectionable. We would be talking about affordable childcare and well-resourced public education that actually prepares people for jobs that earn a living wage. We would be talking about safe communities for housing, about representative government, about healing racially motivated policing and incarceration. If this were about life, the anti-abortion protesters would set down their picket signs and line up to adopt the babies they insist must be born and give generously to support their flourishing into adulthood. This ruling was not about it was about criminalizing women who don't want to be pregnant. It was about criminalizing women's sexuality. It was about criminalizing women's independence. There's nothing in this ruling about holding men involved accountable for their part. I've been pregnant twice and both times I didn't achieve it alone. I hope it's okay to say that. This ruling doesn't hold men responsible for supporting the pregnancy or the mother financial, financially during the pregnancy. Both sides of this argument care about life. And both sides of this argument care about choice. Make no mistake, all this language is gaslighting. What's true is I have less rights than my mother did when she was my age. And now I am a mother to a daughter, and I'm terrified. Yes, I will teach my daughter how to not get pregnant, but I will also teach my son how to not cause a pregnancy. And I will teach them both that I will be a reliable source of information to them and an ever-present help in times of need. And my husband and I will model the partnership of responsibility for parenthood. But 25 to 30% of American women have had an abortion. That means everyone in this room knows and loves someone who has had an abortion whether you're aware of that or not. That means everyone in this room is related to someone who has had an abortion, whether you're aware of that or not. And around 10% of the adult population is LGBTQ, and that means everyone in this room knows and loves someone who is LGBTQ, whether you're aware or not. And that means everyone in this room is related to somebody who is LGBTQ, whether you are aware or not. This decision is devastating for someone you love. This decision is devastating for the people of God. We are called to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world, to proclaim release for the captives, and recovery from sickness and jubilee. 
It's in there twice, Isaiah and Luke. And yet folks out here are proclaiming captivity and sickness and lifelong poverty, as if the most important facet of the gospel were chastity instead of charity. And they're blaming it on God. In this moment, I rely on my upbringing and I turn to the text. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. I tried to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. As I read that text again, I see some things newly. If I read this through the lens of patriarchal domination, I fear for my safety immediately. Because God and the church become like deputized stalkers from which there's no escape. And if I step out of line, perhaps it'll be my last step. But if I read the text for what it actually says, and in general I think that's a good practice, I see the psalmist with freedom to think and decide. And I see a God who provides room for this kind of relationship. I see a psalmist who perhaps feels understood only by God, but is reassured that God is with her and knows her and loves her. Have you ever let someone really know you? I mean, there's like the little bit that we let out in public. And then there's the little bit more that we let out at home for the kitchen people. And then there's like the, like a little bit more we let out for the people that get to the bedroom. But there's still that little bit left that is just for you in the bathroom. I am not the only person with those tears. Why y'all laughing at me? <laughs> Have you ever let anyone all the way to the bathroom level of you? It's scary to open up yourself to another person in that way because if they know you, what if they don't like you anymore and they leave? But this psalmist feels so safe in her relationship with God that it's a tender companionship where she can show her whole self. She can tell her whole truth and be met with love and care and a sense of security. And as I read this text, I just don't see God as a judge. I don't see a God of guilt or shame or exploitation or fear. I don't see her holding back. I just see God with her and it's good. She knows she's made in the image of God. She knows that her relationship with God will empower her to live according to God's will. This psalm is not an apology for life beginning at conception. That is a gross misreading of this text. This psalm is about relationship with God. How God has made us in God's image, how we share in God's work in the world because God has equipped us with understanding. We have a kind of a knowing don't we? That voice inside that guides us. Our knowing helps us to discern and decide. It alerts us to danger. It confirms when we're safe. 
I see this psalmist celebrating her knowing. She trusts herself because she knows that she's made in the image of God. I have felt this knowing in my life. I have never faced an unexpected pregnancy. But I have known when I needed to leave an abusive relationship. I have known when I fell in love. I have known when I was called to ministry. This is the same knowing we can trust when someone comes out to us. When someone trusts us with their story, when someone chooses to terminate a pregnancy, or any time we see injustice or oppression, this knowing is the image of God active in us. This knowing is the image of God active in others, and this knowing is not anything we can regulate. So what do we do? If you are still weeping and gnashing on the floor, you take the time you need. It's okay. Don't let anyone rush you from prayer if you are still casting your cares at the feet of God. But if you are up and ready to go, I want to start with one proposition. If we are all made in the image of God, trust the knowing in each person to lead them. If we are all made in the image of God, trust the knowing in each person to lead them. That means if someone is making a decision you think is right, trust the knowing to lead them. That means if someone is making a decision you think is dead wrong, trust the knowing to lead them. That means if someone is not making a decision and you think they should, trust the knowing to lead them. God has not asked us to make decisions for each other. God has not asked us to regulate one another into submission. God has not asked us to interfere with each other's medical care. God has not asked us to lobby one another into oblivion or harass one another on social media. God has asked us two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. God has asked us to love. Can you imagine how difficult it must be to find yourself unexpectedly pregnant or to acknowledge that you are not straight or not cisgender and afraid that those you love will decide they don't love you anymore? Can you imagine? Statistically, some of you don't have to. Can you imagine how scary it must be to need medical care you cannot get legally unless you have the right connections or bank account balance? Can you imagine how lonely it must be to carry this kind of secret because you don't know who you can trust with all of who you are? Remember our psalmist? So comfortable with God. So free to share herself with them. So at ease in her vulnerability, confident in God's love for her. So if we are to love others as God has loved us, Psalm 139 shows the depth of God's love for us. God loves us by receiving our whole truth, by harboring us in our vulnerability, by respecting our knowing and being with us through all of it. So if you come to me and you tell me you're going to do something and I think it's a great idea, I'm going to love you through it because your knowing will lead you. And if you come to me and you tell me you're going to do something and I think it's a terrible idea, I'm going to love you through it, because your knowing will lead you. 
Because either way, my call is to love you. To see you and honor your knowing and be with you. I trust women. I trust women. I trust queer people. I trust people of color. And I name those particular groups because they are who will suffer the most from this ruling. I hear their self-proclamation and honor their knowing, and I will respond with love. This love isn't just on the individual level either. It can't be. This love will also look like dismantling the patriarchy. Some of you still have all your tools. Hang on to those. If you have extras, share with the people until I'll have enough. Read Acts 2 to learn how. This love will also look like dismantling white supremacy. It's incompatible with the gospel and it's got to go. This love will also look like protecting the rights of LGBTQ persons. This love will also look like protecting reproductive justice. It has to be collective because no one is free until we're all free. And we are most certainly not free. If our children cannot safely come out to us, then they are not free. If we are afraid our daughters might be raped, but we are not afraid that our sons might be rapists, then we are not free. If our women risk their own lives to end pregnancies because they are afraid to ask doctors for help, then we are not free. So what now? Breathe and push. Do you remember that? Breathe and push. Breathe. If the wind is still knocked out of you, breathe deeply until you're ready to get up. And then push. Let us push by loving each other. Let us push by loving without judgment, without filter, without censor, without partisan agenda. Separation of church and state does not mean that church people do nothing. And let me make myself clear when I said when people do things you think are a bad idea, just love them anyway. It was not me saying just do nothing. Because I think if we do nothing, we're kind of morally bankrupt in this moment. I think we have to do something. And I think that something is love. And I think your little heart is going pitter-patter, pitter-patter, because you have a pretty specific idea of what that's going to look like for you. And I think that's your knowing. We show our love when we vote. We show our love when we march. We show our love when we donate. We show our love when we volunteer. We show our love any way we work so that everyone can be free. We show our love when we serve our communities. We show our love when we show up, especially when we show up for other people. Because then we recognize all of our freedom is connected. We show our love by listening to others' whole truth, even and especially when it makes us uncomfortable. We show our love by trusting the knowing. <clears throat> I walked through fire, I came out the other side. I chased desire, I made sure I got what's mine. And I continued to believe that I'm the one for me. And because I'm mine, I walk the line. Cause we're adventurers and heartbreak is our map. A final destination we lack. We stopped asking directions to places. 
says they have never been. And to be loved, we need to be known. We'll finally find our way back home. And through the joy and pain that our lives bring, we can do hard things. I hit rock bottom, it felt like a brand new start. I'm not the problem, sometimes things fall apart. And I continued to believe the best people are free. And it took some time, but I'm finally fine. Cause we're adventurers and heartbreak is our map. A final destination we lack. We stopped asking directions to places they have never been. And to be loved, we need to be known. We'll finally find our way back home. And through the joy and pain that our lives bring, we can do hard things. We can do hard things. Please be seated. Now is the time in the service that we share our joys and concerns with, with each other. Um, I want to start by uh, getting an update on Don Haynes, who was recently hospitalized. So I've been in touch with uh, Don and Charlotte a lot this week. I've been out to see them several times. He is still in the hospital and uh, may be there well, at least one more day possibility of some rehab going on. Right now, uh, Charlotte is still asking <clears throat> for no visitors. Don gets tired. Uh, talking makes him tired. So, uh, but certainly keep them in prayer, and I know that you have, and Charlotte and Don know that too, and appreciate your prayers. Just continue to pray for healing for him, and um, hopefully he'll be returning back home soon. And I also want to mention Tori Erickson and her family after the sudden loss of, of her fiance. Please keep them all in your prayers. Um, anyone else? Um, 
I just wanted to ask prayers for my brother Grant as he continues his uh, struggle with his mental health and recovery and um, uh, legal proceedings. He has a court date tomorrow. So just support for him. Davina's um, reconstructive foot, foot surgery has been moved up to um, Tuesday, day after tomorrow. Um, so we want to pray for not only that the surgery be successful, but that the doctor's hands um, be guided by God and that she heal quickly and be free of pain. Six weeks of no weight bearing, so I'll be um, scooting around in a motorized scooter. Try to catch me. <laughs> Prayers for Davida's upcoming surgery. Since you came all the way over here, I have two things. Um, my sister and her 96-year-old husband got COVID this past week. They seem to be recovering, but of course we've had major concerns for John at his age. Fortunately, the boosters seem to have protect, provided a great deal of protection. He's been ill, but not seriously to the point of needing hospitalization. And then our grandchildren's mother, grandfather, George uh, Newberry, and his partner have been notified that they have to be out of their house by the end of the month because the house is being sold and they do not have resources. They do not have much in the way of problem solving abilities at this point in their lives to be able to make these decisions and, and make the arrangements needed. So Colleen is having to try to help from 100 miles away and there's all kinds of decisions, none of which seem to be good ones that are on her plate. So if you could remember Colleen, her recovery process is threatened by this kind of stress and we, we, we uh, so we have grave concerns for that. Chris, did you have one? <coughs> Anyone else wanna share? Justin Bolton has been missing for quite some time. His family is very concerned. Five weeks. Um, and let's keep Janet Baldwin, Susan's mother, in our prayers as well, and Janet as her caregiver. Anyone else? Did you? Did you mention Jim Waller? Jim Waller? Yes. No, I didn't. Okay. Very hard time getting over this bout with COVID and um, very weak from what I understand. I have called Kitty, but she has not returned my call. Anyone else? And I'll just add the people of Ukraine and those affected by gun violence. And now, assured of God's great love for us, let us return to God a portion of the many gifts that God has given us. So 
dearly beloved children of God, do you sometimes wake not to prayer but to dread, fearing what new horror will show up in the news, afraid to learn where the mass shootings will be today, afraid for your friends and family in war-torn nations? Take heart. Let your dread be your prayer, your longing for freedom for all peoples. Are you near despair over the future of the country you used to and still want to love? In so many places, laws are being introduced that would remove needed protections from the least powerful and grant increasingly authoritarian power to those already wealthy and already in power. Take heart. Let your despair be your prayer, your longing for a future for all peoples. Would you rather see cute kittens and puppies on the internet than learn about the news? Do you wish you could rescue every abandoned furry creature but run out of patience with people who post conspiracy theories and fake news and memes that denigrate other human beings? Take heart. <clears throat> Let your delight in God's creatures be your prayer. Your reminder that there is a common love of life among humankind. Do you have moments, days, weeks, months, when you think you no longer can pray? Don't even know if you still want to pray. Take heart. Your non-prayer is in itself prayer and is often the deepest possible prayer. Dearly beloved children of God, take heart, for there is nothing in heaven or earth no power, no government, nothing that any human being can do that can ever separate you from the love of God. Take heart. For the one who began a good work in you, in all of us, long before the world was born, will carry it through to completion. Today we lift up those among us who have concerns. We pray for Don Hayes, for Tori Erickson and family, for Susan and Janet Baldwin, for the family of Debbie Moore, for the child missing in the Bolton family. We pray for Kyle's brother Grant, for Davida's upcoming surgery, for John's sister's husband, and for his relative George and George's partner. We pray for the people of Ukraine and all of those affected by gun violence. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as you go out from this place, may you follow your knowing. May you feel the love of God with you always. Breathe and push so that we may live out the call God has given to us, which is love. May love win this day and every day. Amen.